शिव शक्तुक्त यदि शक्त प्रभावित न चेदेव देव न खलु कुशल स्पंदी अथस्वाध्यंग हरिहर विरिंचादिभरपी प्रणंतुम स्तोतुम वाकतमकृतपुण्या प्रभवती शिवाशक्तुक्त यारी भावती शक्त प्रभावित न चे देव देव न खलु कुशल स्पंदी अथस्वाम आराध्यं हरिहर विरिंचादिभरपी प्रणंतुम स्तोतुम वाकतमकृतपुण्य प्रभावती Only when conjoined with Shakti, thyself, can Shiva earn the privilege to become Ishwara, overlord. Otherwise, he is not even able to stir. O goddess, you are worthy of being adored, even by Hari, Hara, Virincha, and others. Therefore, how can one who has acquired no merit dare either to salute or praise thee? Namaste. So this is the opening shloka of the great poem by Sri Shankaracharya of the Sri Sandaurya Lahari. Now, first of all, the object of this poem is to describe the ontological position of the goddess. Okay, everyone is familiar with this concept of God, but very few people understand the idea of Shakti or goddess. Let me give you a crude example: a power plant. Huh? A power plant is generating huge amounts of electricity. It has lots of power. It is powerful. But unless there is a distribution network that carries that power to all the homes, well, what's the use of it? Uh, it can't do anything. The power is there, but it can't be put to work. So in the same way, God is powerful, but his power is distributed by the Shakti. So he, in a way, delegates his power to the Shakti, because Shiva, <laughs> Shiva just likes to sit and contemplate. He's not so much interested in action in the world, although sometimes he goes out in the world or appears to. Actually, he is everything. Consciousness or pure awareness is everything that we experience. But that awareness doesn't have anything to be aware of, unless that power is distributed, unless it's broadcast, unless it's radiated out, and that's Shakti. So Shiva is the powerful, and Shakti is the power. They can't be separated, huh? They're intrinsically one, like Yin and Yang. Yin and Yang. Define each other, and in the same way, the powerful and the power define each other. They're complementaries, so they can't be separated without losing their identities. So that's why the verse says that without Shakti, Shiva is nothing. He can't even move. Uh, he can't do anything. He simply is. He exists. He has being. To have action, and to have a world in which to experience that action, that means shakti is necessary. So that shakti is broadcast, is distributed, uh, is delegated, or emanated, or radiated, 
by Shiva and that becomes his actions. So what are his actions? Well, basically there's three. The creation, maintenance, and destruction of the world. So she is also known as Tripura. And the world is also divided into three. The earthly planetary systems, the heavenly worlds, and the spiritual world. So in this way, many triples or triads come into existence. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, and each one has a Shakti. And those Shaktis all emanate from the Para Shakti. Uh, the Para Shakti is who we are worshiping in this prayer. So, we are extracting this material from a commentary by Sri Chandrasekharendra Saraswati, also known as Mahapariva or Mahapariya. Who is he? Well, he was contemporary with Ramana Maharshi. He was a fully self-realized spiritual master in the line of Shankaracharya. In fact, he's known as the Shankaracharya of Kanchi, Kanchi Puram. So he used his immense mystic powers to help others only for the benefit of others, not for his own benefit. This was his great glory. Although he had, I mean, there are many stories. You can look him up on the internet huh? and read some of these stories. They're just amazing and fantastic and full of compassion and wonderful qualities. But he never used those powers for himself. He remained a very simple, humble uh, sannyasi who owned nothing, really, except his staff and a pair of sandals. <laughs> but he walked all over India. Uh, he traveled on foot in the traditional way of the sannyasi to give blessings and to revitalize ancient temples that had fallen into disuse or disrepair. And so because of that, he's known as Mahapariya. Pariya means a very important person, a very glorious person. And so he is the greatest among them, therefore Mahapariya. So what kind of a person was he? Well, he was a great scholar and a musician. Huh? He played the veena and sang very expertly. He knew the uh, uh, Carnatic tradition of music very, very well. And his writing was mainly concentrated, actually speaking, he didn't write anything, but others wrote down his speaking, which was centered on revealing the ontological position of Shakti. Because people misunderstand they think Shakti is just some maybe local goddess or some object of a, a religious cult, sectarian religion, dualistic religion, like that. And yes, you can take her that way, but you will miss out on so many of the benefits. <laughs> then, okay, so above that on the scale of the four darshanams, is bhakti. One can develop bhakti towards her and that opens up the treasure chest of her blessings. Huh? Trust me, I've experienced them for myself. A few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, I did the Mahalakshmi or Siddha Lakshmi Stotram as a homa, a fire sacrifice, and I experienced a tremendous healing. I'm going to do it again on the new moon in a few days. So, also, there is a magical tradition associated with this Saundarya Lahari. Each verse has a specific power, and we'll get into that in a minute. First of all, I want to go into the first shloka. Of course, like most Sanskrit works, Shankaracharya put the essence of his whole poem into the first shloka. 
So if you understand the first shloka deeply, you'll understand the meaning of the whole prayer. So the first shloka contains several essential points that I want to go over. And the first is that Shiva and Shakti are equal in importance and power. It's not that Shiva is primary and Shakti is secondary. Huh? Because just like the power plant example, without the distribution network, the power of the power plant has no use at all. It's just <laughs> static. Huh? So Shakti is necessary so that Shiva's power is distributed and becomes active and available to all the beings. And also, Para Shakti is higher than the Trimurti of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Because those deities are in relation to the material creation. Brahma creates, Vishnu maintains, and Shiva destroys. But beyond them is Parashakti and Parashiva. Huh? And we'll go into later all the ways in which they are equal. So the worship, seva, which is meaning service, prostrations or praise by a devotee to Shakti happens only by her grace. In other words, it's not something we can do, but it's something that she awards by her grace, by her mercy, through her compassion. Therefore, she's known as the Divine Mother. And another point in the first verse is that jnana, the ultimate path of self-realization, is only for those who qualify Others should practice karma yoga and bhakti yoga to develop their qualifications. And we see that in India a lot, uh, that people try to jump up to jnana. And of course, they simply fall down. They fail. Their meditation just kind of leads nowhere. Why? They don't have the qualification, the adhikar. So finally, there's a quote. Unless one has earned spiritual merit in 100 crores of births, one cannot access jnana marga and obtain moksha. And that's from another work by Shankaracharya, the Viveka Chudamani. And it's the very first verse. Huh? So the funny thing is, the people who uh, misuse the path of jnana often quote from Viveka Chudamani, but they don't quote that verse. <laughs> you know, just like the people in the Christians who like to quote Jesus, but they never quote that verse about uh, a rich man can never enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> so similarly, the people who want to take jnana very cheaply and think they can obtain moksha without any qualification. They have to realize they have to qualify. And a hundred crores, what's a crore is 10 million huh? in Vedic numbering system. A lakh is a hundred thousand and a crore is a hundred times of the lakh. So 10 million. And he's saying a hundred crores of birth, births that's a billion, huh? one with nine zeros after it, a billion births of pious activities to qualify for moksha, for liberation. So it's not easy, it's not cheap. It's not something you can just assume, like uh, an attitude <laughs> or you know the latest fashions or whatever but it's something that has to be earned and it's not at all cheap. So each verse in Saundarya Lahari has a specific power. After all, Shakti means power. And the first shloka has the power of winning in every field. If you memorize and recite this shloka, this will bring you Shakti, 
Huh? You will become a winner. You will begin to win in every area of life. And this is my experience huh? by being associated with this path, the Sri Vidya, the knowledge of Shakti. I have really transformed my life. I sit here in my beautiful house, really all alone, doing nothing. <laughs> well, I worship Shakti is what I do. Every move I make is a dance in her praise. And every offering I make is love for her. And every thought that I have is simply about her glories and so on. This is, this is the life. And it's a life of bliss. And that's why I'm so happy all the time. Huh? People say, oh, you look so vibrant and you look so happy. Well, yeah, because I don't mix with low-minded people. That's a great secret. Huh? Don't cheapen yourself by allowing yourself to accept the company of low-minded people. That means people who are interested in money, power, fame, and so on like that, or even knowledge. Huh? Knowledge is of little use if it's not put to work in worship of the highest. So anyway, some of the other shlokas are, for example, in shloka 2, attracting all the world, in shloka 3, attainment of all knowledge, and so on. So by going through these shlokas of Saundarya Lahari, one can earn tremendous benefits. And of course, the greatest benefit is moksha not to have to take birth again. Freedom from birth and death. This is the greatest benediction. So how do we do it? Well, each shloka of Saundarya Lahari has an associated yantra. And here's the yantra for text one. It's just a square with circles on the corners and the Sanskrit character kling. Kling, of course, is a mula mantra, a root mantra. And kling signifies the satisfaction of desires. So many mantras that uh, revolve around this idea of satisfying one's desires begin with kling because it invokes the shakti, the aspect of shakti, the itcha shakti, uh, the shakti of desire. So one makes this yantra huh? and uh, supposed to be on a gold plate. <laughs> we don't have a gold plate, so I'm using a copper plate. A copper plate is almost as pure as gold. Huh? So I'm putting the yantra on a copper plate and then reciting the mantra. Here are the criteria from the scripture itself. There are two parts to the worship of the first shloka. Both involve making the yantra with colored flour on a gold plate, putting a ghee lamp in front, and worshiping facing east. You're supposed to do it for 12 days and chant 1,000 mantras every day. That's quite a lot of chanting. You'd have to do it pretty fast. And offering a special preparation called Tri Madhura, which is shredded coconut mixed with jaggery, which is raw sugar, and ghee. Mm. <laughs> and the result is successful attainment of desired objects. So if you have any desire, huh, you don't need to state it explicitly in your prayer. Huh? Goddess knows. <laughs> Don't forget who she is. She is Kundalini. She is the life force. She is within you. She is you. She knows everything about you. Uh, probably better than you do. <laughs> so she knows what you want. She knows what you need. All you need is the pious credits to deserve the blessing. And you get that through the worship of these powerful mantras. 
ओम तत्सत ओम हरि ओम